Action Group, Arthur Stamoulis of Citizens Trade Campaign, Elaine Bernard, formerly of Harvard's Labor and Work Life Program, and Sharon Treat of the Institute of Agriculture and Trade Policy. Each of them is going to speak for about seven minutes, and after that, we're going to take as much time as we have left for your comments and questions. You don't have to wait until the end to chime in, though. At the bottom of your screen, there should be a Q&A button that allows you to type in questions or other brief thoughts for our panelists as they come to you. If you don't see that button on your computer or phone app, you may need to click on or touch the screen for it to actually pop up. It's also possible that it may be under the more button, sometimes represented by three dots. But if you play with it a bit, you should be able to see that Q&A button. We're not taking questions in the chat box. If you want your questions to get to the moderator, that's me, please use that Q&A function. Finally, let me mention that we're also streaming live on the main Fair Trade Campaign Facebook page, and we're recording this for possible future broadcast elsewhere. We encourage people who are able to do so to please like and share that stream on the main Fair Trade Campaign Facebook page. With that said, let's get into our program. First up is Dana Gill. She is the U.S. Policy Advisor for the Access Campaign at Doctors Without Borders, a Nobel Prize winning organization recently in the news for providing on the ground support to address the COVID-19 pandemic in the Navajo Nation. She has more than 15 years of experience in government and community relations and thrives on building initiatives that promote more just, equitable, and sustainable societies. Dana, welcome. Thanks, Matt, and hi to everyone from Michigan. Um, I hope you're well in these times and, and really thanks for having me excited to join you today. Um, if you're not familiar with Médecins Sans Frontières, MSF, Doctors Without Borders, uh, we are a medical humanitarian organization operating in more than 70 countries around the world. And typically our product projects happen in low and middle income countries, but due to the unprecedented nature of uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, as Matt shared, for the first time in our history, we find ourselves working in developed nations, including countries in Europe and Canada and in multiple project sites here in the United States. Um, I work on access to medicines issues specifically uh, through the Access Campaign, and MSF created the Access Campaign 20 years ago uh, to confront the problem of not being able to access and or afford the medical tools and treatments that they needed on the ground to, to, to help the people that we serve. Um, and if, uh, if we can be on the third slide, I can't actually see which slides we're on. So if we're on slide number three, we're in good shape. And uh, it should say the, the need during COVID. Perfect, great. Um, so of course, there are so many pressing medical priorities that MSF and other groups are dealing with all of the time, but indeed our operations have had to shift to COVID-19. And we, like the world, in order to um, confront this virus, are going to need vast quantities of effective, approved, and affordable tests, treatments, vaccines, and supplies. Next slide. So what stands in the way of that need? Um, well, first, of course, we're confronted with the fact that there's no coordinated mechanism, no coordinated effort. Every government is uh, dealing with their response in a different way. And here in the U.S., we're seeing that play out with the federal governments and the states uh, having totally different approaches to this virus. Next step. And then... We have all of the historic issues 
that impact drug pricing and drug availability at play here. COVID is new, but these issues aren't new. We've been dealing with this for decades, right? So next slide. And in this context, uh, one of the main areas that MSF has worked for a really long time and is continuing during the time of COVID is calling for uh, no patents or profiteering um, to get in the way of, of our response to COVID-19. Next slide. Um, you know, it can't be business as usual. If the system is allowed to operate the way it normally does, we will no doubt see really high prices uh, and an inability to get the supplies and medications we need. We've already seen that with PPE. We've already seen it with ventilators and tests, right? And, and what happens with, with upcoming treatments and vaccines. Um, so a quick patents 101, because we talk about uh, no patents, no profits, what does that mean? Um, patents are a government granted property right that allows ownership of an invention. So let's call that invention a vaccine. And in the US, that means that for 20 years, one company owns and controls that vaccine. How much is produced, where it's produced, where, you know, where it gets to go, and of course, at what price. Next. And for decades, we've seen plenty of examples of how when you remove those IP barriers, those IP protections, those patent protections, multiple, generally generic producers are able to come into the market, produce a lot more product at a much lower price. Um, so this example of um, HIV medicines uh, took years of legal battles to get rid of those patent protections. And in this time of COVID, we don't have the luxury of, of time to make sure that there are multiple producers and low prices. Uh, next slide. So at any time, these types of IP barriers are uh, suboptimal. These monopolies are suboptimal, but in the time of COVID-19, they are downright irresponsible and dangerous. Um, and as you know, through, through all of your great work, these protect protections not only exist in US law, um, but they are enforced and ensconced in trade agreements, right? And the US tries to export these corporate protections all around the world through agreements and, and then you know, different protections like sanctions. Uh, next slide. So don't worry, I'm not gonna go through this whole slide, um, but no doubt through your work, you are familiar with TRIPS flexibilities, um, which are widely used by countries to gain access to lower price generic medicines, particularly through the use of one of the tools known as compulsory licensing. And uh, I'll just take a moment to stop and say thank you because I know we've worked on a lot of similar issues and been in partnership you have with my predecessors fighting the TPP and other negotiations and agreements that would erode these types of principles. So, so thank you for that. And next slide. But even during this pandemic, sadly, uh, we are seeing business as usual from the US and pharma. The US trade representative is bullying countries through the special 301 report that want to make uh, use of their, their, their rights and TRIPS flexibilities. Uh, the USTR is naming and shaming countries that want to make a broader use of compulsory licensing and the other legal tools they have to ensure there's a proper supply of what they need and at low prices. Um, and then, you know, really distressing here in the US, refusing to put any provision um, on US companies, even though we're giving them billions of dollars of, uh, of taxpayer money for the research and development of these, um, of these tools. So billions of taxpayer dollars with no strings attached. Next. So two more slides, what are we doing about it? MSF uh, and hundreds of civil society 
groups around the world are being vocal online, in the media, with government and multilateral institution engagement, um, on the trade side specifically, calling for a halt to trade negotiations at this time where countries really need to be focused on what's, what's happening and what they're doing with their citizens on the ground to eradicate this virus and stop the spread. Um, we're calling for protection of full trips flexibilities, which of course, countries like the US are trying to erode at this moment, um, calling for mandatory sharing of information so that IP monopolies don't stand in the way of adequate supply, um, and calling for more and more governments to use compulsory licensing and the other tools they have to keep companies from controlling production and pricing that isn't in the public's best interest. And in the long run, we really need to use this moment to look for a, for a better system. Next slide. We have seen some companies starting to do the right thing on their own, but certainly not enough. Next slide. And other countries that are taking um, actions to make sure that they're using their tools or putting into law that they can that they can override patents um, and use their trips flexibilities and more and more countries need to do this. So thank you. Um, certainly not enough time, but uh, but uh, glad to be with you. And we'll look forward to answer questions later. Dana Gill, thank you very much for that presentation. We're going to move on now to uh, Bryn Gay. Bryn is the Hep C Project Director at the Treatment Action Group, an independent activist and community-based research and policy think tank fighting for better treatment, prevention, vaccines, and a cure for hepatitis C, tuberculosis, and HIV. Prior to joining the Treatment Action Group, she provided trade and intellectual property expertise with the United Nations Development Program in Sri Lanka and Thailand and the North-South Institute in Canada. She also led ACT UP campaigns to address H high HIV and HCV medicine prices. Bryn, welcome and thanks for being here. Thank you, Matthew. Um, I hope you can hear me. All good? Cool. Um, thank you for that wonderful introduction and also just the opportunity to speak with all of you. Um, this is an incredible group across the Northeast and I'm really privileged to be part of this discussion. Um, as Matt mentioned, um, I will be discussing farmer lies, people die, busting myths about medicine development. Next slide, please. So I usually like to put my uh, takeaways up front. That way you can fast forward, you can have a coffee, um, come back to this. Um, but my key takeaways that I hope you'll, um, that will, you'll stick, um, will stick in your mind are that um, the first um, main takeaway is that publicly funded research and development um, drives true innovation, not stronger intellectual property protection. And secondly, um, government has the power to use legal flexibilities, such as compulsory licensing, um, outlined by Dana, um, to produce and lower prices. And thirdly, um, to note that solidarity, global cooperation, open science are among the essential principles to integrate in trade policies to fast track access to COVID-19 technologies for everyone. Next slide, please. Okay, so um, Treatment Action Group developed this myth-busting uh, fact sheet to help us prepare evidence-based arguments uh, to some of the common myths that we're hearing um, that are being circulated by the pharmaceutical lobby, um, as well as by policymakers and the media. Um, and this fact sheet, I pulled out a few, um, and the three um, that are most relevant for this discussion today. Um, the first one that we, we often hear is that um, the pharmaceutical industry, that Big Pharma is driving innovations through its R&D investments. Um, in fact, governments and philanthropy are funding over 40% in overall R&D costs, particularly the earlier and riskier stages. Pharma then privatizes this work under patent protection, um, and they end up cornering the market exclusively for around 20 years and sometimes longer. Um, we're seeing that in a lot of the different free trade agreements. 
When this happens, U.S. taxpayers are um, paying twice for patented medicines, first in the form of government collected taxes um, that fund the research, and then uh, secondly through payer systems such as Medicaid and Medicare um, that procure these medicines. So the sec second myth I think we often hear is that the current drug development model um, works and that it's going to lead to new medicines for rare and neglected diseases um, such as COVID-19. Um, and in fact, very little of research and development funds are allocated for this. Um, over an 11 year period, um, only 4% of new medicines and 1% of research and development dollars were for neglected diseases. And thirdly, um, something that has been circulating a lot in the media is that um, countries and generic manufacturers are free riders on US innovation. In fact, rich countries, other rich countries such as in the UK and in Europe um, are showing proportionately equal to, uh, gross domestic expenditure on R&D as in um, as the United States. Next slide, please. Okay, so this is very busy. I'm, I'm glad that this graphic uh, could show up. Um, and it's just to say that, you know, we're gonna continue to hear these myths. Um, when, when, new, when new treatments and hopefully a vaccine are proven safe and effective, um, when they come to market, we're gonna need to rally together to make sure that we decentralize production, that we facilitate global access so that other countries can manufacture locally. And we need to strengthen our capabilities to domestically produce active pharmaceutical ingredients and a essential medicines. So Treatment Action Group developed this infographic to show the very um, complicated and um, one of the myths around the sort of hepatitis C uh, cure um, and how this was come, came into development. Um, it shows a lot of the pharma shenanigans behind it. Um, you, you'll note that there's a very uh, consolidated supply chain, um, particularly um, in China. You're, you'll see that a lot of the active pharmaceutical ingredients, the basic chemicals that go into the hep C cure are, um, are manufactured in China, um, then sent over to Bangladesh um, for compounding the chemicals into different like pill capsules, then sent over to Italy for packaging and branding, eventually sent to different countries that fall into the um, Gilead's voluntary license and wherever the drug is uh, registered. So we're told that the high price tag of $84,000 for a 12 week treatment course is necessary, that they took all these risks, um, that this is for this novel innovation and that it involves a very complicated production process. But if you look closely, you'll see that there's tens of millions of public funding that went into Spoth uh, research and development. Um, also, I think you might've seen that uh, a researcher, Dr. Andrew Hill at the University of Liverpool and colleagues uh, showed the true cost of producing these drugs. Um, a true cost for Savasovir is around $62, including a 10% profit margin. So this is um, compared to Gilead's list price at about $84,000 uh, a treatment course. So as the saying goes, pills cost pennies, greed costs lives. You've heard this often a lot. Um, next slide, please. So we can't afford to buy into these myths. Um, we're on a path to leaving behind patients if we do. Um, we've seen before COVID-19, there's these trends of revenge politics. This has been characterized by Canadian scholar Max Haven, um, as well as a lot of trade retaliation. Um, these efforts are, are happening. They're, they're ramping up during the pandemic. And um, just a couple of examples. Um, uh, in, in April, the U.S. had threatened retaliation on India when it tried to put an export ban in place for hydroxychloroquine. Um, this is a controversial drug. It's, it's shown to have a lot of safety issues. Um, but just to show that there is this threat of retaliation. Um, then um, we also are seeing um, efforts to defund research. For instance, in China recently, the U.S. has defunded research on the origins of the coronavirus as part of a blame game for the pandemic. We can't let this kind of retaliation um, isolate us and we, you know, this could lead to um, disrupting some of our supplies and um, particularly of essential medicines. So instead, our efforts to build resilience um, during these very uncertain times, we need to be able to recognize our trade interdependence. Uh, we need to see that China and India uh, are um, providing about 75 to 80% of the active pharmaceutical ingredients that are imported into the United States. 
Um, we're also seeing that pharma is going to de-pharma. Um, they're going to try to push for stronger and longer intellectual property and trade agreements. And we're not going to be able to beat this pandemic with vaccine nationalism and pharma monopolies. Um, I do want to um, shout out that scientists are workers as well, and we need to be able to organize research and development differently. Next slide, please, and I'm wrapping this up. Um, so as part of our efforts to flip the pharma narrative and to work towards an alternative research development model, um, there's a few campaigns that I invite you to look into. There's the Free the Vaccine as well as the Open COVID Pledge. They try to encourage companies to uh, make their COVID-19 related um, intellectual property available at no costs. Um, and there's a few advocacy demands that I think we all need to incorporate into any of our um, outreach and um, any of our sort of campaign messaging. Next slide. So thank you. Um, I invite you to uh, check out any of our advocacy materials that I mentioned today for a closer look on our website. And, um, and thank you. Uh, I hand it over to the next presenter. Thank you very much, Bryn. Uh, this is Bryn Gay, the Hep C Project Director at the Treatment Action Group. And right now we're going to move on to Arthur Stamoulis. Arthur is the Executive Director of Citizens Trade Campaign, a U.S.-based coalition of labor, environmental, family farm, faith, and consumer organizations working together to improve international trade policy. He got involved in trade organizing after participating in the 1999 battle in Seattle, where he was inspired by the power of cross-sector, cross-border coalition building. Prior to joining CTC, Arthur worked as the Director of Government Affairs at the Clean Air Council in Pennsylvania. Welcome, Arthur. Well, thanks, Matt. Uh, and thank you, everyone, for the opportunity to speak with you today. Uh, uh, I'm going to describe two of the ways that trade-related outsourcing have made us less resilient in the face of the COVID pandemic. Uh, so to start, you know, the United States is the richest most powerful country in the world. Uh, we have a continent-wide wealth of natural resources at our disposal. Uh, and yet, even with months of notice, we were unable to produce the face masks, the hand sanitizer, the medical equipment that we needed to keep us safe. Um, you know, the fact that our medical professionals and other essential frontline workers have been putting their lives on the line without adequate supplies of, of the things that they need to keep them safe from infection, um, you know, this isn't just bad and unconscionable. Uh, this is the, di the direct and predictable result of policies that have helped corporations to outsource manufacturing throughout the world, wherever workers are the most exploited and wherever environmental regulations are the weakest, um, so that they can create these supply chains that prioritize profits over all other considerations. Um, so there's no question in my mind, you know, that the ineptitude and the mistakes of the current administration have exacerbated problems with getting supplies where they're the most needed. Uh, but in this instance, the shortfalls in personal protective equipment and things like that uh, were born in large part by trade policies that destroyed much of the nation's manufacturing base over a period of decades. Uh, and so I don't want to drop too much data on people, but 20 years ago, before China entered the WTO and, and the outsourcing of US manufacturing went completely hog wild, uh, the US had a trade surplus in ventilators. We had a trade surplus in medical equipment. We had a trade surplus in, in test kits. Uh, and in the years since, those surpluses have all shifted to multi-million dollar trade deficits. Um, over that same period of time, 99 to 2019, uh, we've seen our deficits in face masks balloon 446%. The deficit in other PPE has increased 464%, and the deficit in disinfectant and sterilizers has grown 3,724%. This all according to government data from the U.S. International Trade Commission. So, you know, these trade policies that have destroyed middle class jobs, that have expanded inequality, that have harmed the environment, that have ignored human rights abuses, they've also made us less, less safe during a public health emergency. Um, you know, we used to be capable of making PPE and ventilators and other needed goods right here at home. Uh, but, you know, we, and, and we used to have factories that might have been able to upscale production when needed. But now, due to outsourcing, we've got this situation where you have hospital workers reusing masks, 
States have been outbidding each other for ventilators and other medical equipment. And frankly, too many frontline workers have just gone without the safety gear that they need. Uh, and so looking forward, if we wanna be able to produce things that we need to survive a future crisis, we need to rebuild manufacturing capacity. Uh, and that means rewriting our trade policies to allow for industrial policy. In other words, we need trade rules that respect countries' right to use public procurement preferences, to use subsidies, even to use tariffs uh, to support the production of key products and the growth of key sectors. And let me be clear, you know, this doesn't mean that we shouldn't be importing things, and it doesn't mean that we shouldn't be exporting things either. But if we want a resilient economy for the next crisis that's guaranteed to happen, uh, we can't have these pseudo monopolies where the whole world is dependent on one region, and in some instances, even one factory for life-saving equipment. You know, there need to be more diverse supply chains. And related to that, decisions about where goods go in a crisis can't just be based on who has the most money to spend, right? This whole deal with states outbidding each other and countries outbidding each other for the last shipment of, of rubber gloves or what have you, um, you know, that can't go on. Governments need to be empowered to make decisions about where life-saving supplies are the most needed and where they get allocated during an emergency. Um, and so that's one of the big ways that outsourcing has hurt us in the face of COVID-19. Um, I've, to to I've been asked to also mention another, and that's the race to the bottom in wages. So the US has seen roughly 5 million jobs lost due to either direct outsourcing or displacement by imports under trade deals like NAFTA and the WTO. More and more jobs lost every week. Uh, this obviously has a huge impact on the families that are directly affected. Uh, but it also has big impacts on, on the wider community in ways that aren't often acknowledged. You know, so the, la the loss of middle class jobs means less money to, for people to spend at local businesses from restaurants to hair salons to car dealerships. Uh, the loss of middle class jobs also means a smaller tax base for our schools, our fire departments, other public services. Uh, this is especially true in rural areas where a single plant closure can have a major impact on the community's overall tax revenue. And if those things weren't bad enough, even worse, all this outsourcing is putting a very real downward pressure on the wages and the benefits of the jobs that are left. Uh, one study estimates that the downward pressure on wages and benefits caused by outsourcing cost the majority of American workers 5.5% of their income every year. And that's even after the benefit of you know, lower cost TV sets and, and tube socks and other imported sweatshop goods is factored in. So you know, for the average American household, 5.5% of your income is almost $3,500 out of your pockets each and every year. You, know, you extend that over a decade, that's an estimated you know, 35 grand less in your family's bank account. And so maybe you've heard the statistic about how roughly 40% of Americans don't have $400 saved up for an emergency. Um, you know, I'm sure whether you've heard it or not, many of the people here are in a situation where you've run through whatever savings you had just trying to survive this plague. Well, you know, imagine if your household had an extra $3,500 in your pocket this year and last year and the year before that and the year before that. You know, you wouldn't, you wouldn't be living large but you'd probably be able to weather the storm a little bit better anyhow. Uh, and so when we talk about building resilience into our economy moving forward, you know, yes, we need more resilient supply chains for PPE and medical equipment. And yes, we absolutely need to cooperate globally when it comes to creating and distributing new medicines and vaccines. But we also need resiliency when it comes to individuals' livelihoods. You know, no more race to the bottom trade agreements that pit workers in one country against workers in another to see who can make things for the absolute lowest price and the absolute worst conditions. You know, we need strong enforced labor and environmental standards, we need high wage standards, and we need a social safety net. You know, and that's gotta be part of how we rewrite our trade rules for a more resilient global economy moving forward. And just the last thing I'll say very quickly, um, which I think is important in this, you know, this era of phony America first rhetoric from our political leaders. Uh, working people in Mexico and in China and in other countries are not our enemies here. Um, I, I would argue they shouldn't even be viewed as our competitors. They are not the problem. The problem is that our own elected officials and policymakers uh, keep prioritizing the demands of greedy uh, corporations over prioritizing the needs of working families. And as a result, 
working people in every country have been on the losing end and have had less uh, resources to weather storms like COVID-19. Uh, and the alternative to this isn't more rhetoric pitting worker against worker. It's trade deals that actually put people on the planet first across borders. Well, let, me, let me turn it back to you, Matt. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. That's Arthur Stumoulis, Executive Director of the Citizens Trade Campaign. A quick reminder that uh, we we're going to have some uh, time for discussion, your questions and comments at the end, but you don't have to wait until the end to put those in there. So at the bottom of your screen, if you click on the Q&A, you can leave a question or a comment for our esteemed panel. Up next, Elaine Bernard. Uh, Elaine is the recently retired director of Harvard Law School's Labor and Work Life Program. The author of numerous books, articles, and speeches related to the labor movement, her work often focuses on the role of unions in promoting civil society, democracy, and economic growth. She served on the boards of various organizations and publications, including the Labor Network for Sustainability. Elaine, welcome. Thank you. Understandably, over the last while, there's been um, a preoccupation with the global disruption by COVID-19, and in many ways, it seems to have taken so much center space that climate change seems to have just disappeared. And yet, we're still getting the occasional story on climate change. For instance, uh, um, uh, we understand from uh, both the Harvard uh, School of Public Health and from Canadian researchers that pollution has been a factor. Uh, if you live in a polluted, badly polluted environment, you have higher rates of illness and deaths from COVID-19. So pollution has been a factor in making the epidemic worse. On the other hand, with the lockout, lockdown, we've seen for the first time clear air uh, in areas that you know people haven't seen for years, whether it's India, China, hell, even some US cities. And so there's been, um, uh, so now as we start to restart the economy from the shutdown, of course, there's some concern because it was the shutdown that seemed to dissipate some of this uh, pollution. And now what we're going to see is not only many of these industries start up with the same problems that led to the pollution, but in fact, uh, some of them are going to go even at greater pace trying to catch up. And so it brings back this question of, of, you know, how can we use this moment to start to envision things a little differently? Uh, in our case, in the United States, of course, the administration has used the crisis to gut environmental standards even further and faster, feeling that people are paying too much attention to COVID, which appears to, our administration appears to not want to talk about, and uh, using this crisis as an opportunity to gut standards and protections. So it, it's one of those odd moments where we have possibilities. People have seen um, that we could have a different way of living. We could have clear skies. We could have a much more sustainable environment. But what is the power that we need to in fact uh, make that possible. Now COVID has been a tremendous blow to working people. And of course we keep hearing the economy as if there's an economy other than workers. I mean, you remove the workers, you don't have an economy. Uh, and it's a really good uh, way of remembering that workers are indeed the economy. Coming out of this crisis, there will be considerable job loss. There already is. There'll be uh, company bankruptcies. And this is something that we also recognize will be happening increasingly with climate change. So it's important here as we come back, bring the economy back to, to look at this as an opportunity to develop new economic models with a focus more on sustainable, healthy communities. We're even seeing, getting a little glimpse at some of how this could happen. 
whether it's uh, some firms and some communities that have used this crisis to experiment in transitioning to more socially useful production, such as producing, you know, manufacturing firms that never considered producing health products or PP, PPE or ventilators or, or sourcing food and delivery were forced to do that. And now maybe here's an opportunity to see about refitting and redesigning some of our production capacity with social needs at the forefront instead of just always uh, uh, profits. Uh, COVID exposes, as does climate change, that our current capitalist economic model is not sustainable. However, in this crisis, it's also given millions of people an opportunity to glimpse at different types of things that we could be doing that are more sustainable uh, and socially useful. Large numbers of people have been uh, 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 forced to use new types of systems, not going to work, but still going to work only online, not physically traveling, but still able to communicate as we're doing here with uh, an online conference. So these things have been available, but there's a huge difference between hundreds and thousands of people doing it and millions. And that's what we're seeing with this crisis, which really opens a lot of opportunity in my mind. Uh, what we've also seen is the Id idea that things that were seen as it'll never happen in our lifetime, you know, uh, uh, not something that would ever be possible, all of a sudden, almost in a blink of an eye, became possible. Uh, and became imaginable. And that I think is really important and is uh, for us to think about today. And when we start to force us to focus on human needs as a priority, then a lot more things do become possible. The pandemic climate change will both force us uh, uh, to remember that, and uh, I totally agree with Arthur on this, that we're an interconnected community. There's no such thing as whether it's a one state or one country solution. The pandemic showed that in, in a very clear illustration, but that's also true with trade. That's also true with the economy. So the pandemic has exposed, in particular here in the US, the pathetic state of our labor relations and workplace governance systems and worker protection. I mean, here we are one of the most advanced industrial countries with some of the uh, uh, highest, uh, most educated healthcare workers. And uh, this crisis really laid us low. Climate activists usually call for what's called a just transition uh, for workers in various fossil fuel industries, et cetera. Well, I think the pandemic is, and coming out of the pandemic, is the first shot at looking at what would be a just transition, because that's what we're about to happen now. We are going to transition from the lockdown to the economy. But are we going to go backwards to the same economy that brought us this crisis, or are we going to start to use some of our ideas around just transition and try them, not just for uh, dealing with coming out of COVID-19, but for dealing with the crisis that we're still in, which is around climate change. And you know, some of the things we've seen is the need for emergency benefits because of the total inadequacy and uh, lack of societal uh, social safety net in this country. Uh, the recognition that we see with COVID-19, that workers have few rights in the workplace in face of life-threatening challenges. Uh, that the benefits in the United States that workers receive through work are really inadequate and they're tied uh, specifically to their employer. And so when the employer, you know, goes bankrupt, etc., the workers frequently lose everything. Uh, millions of workers have been misclassified and all sorts of 
uh, as independent contractors and the like. So what we need to think of is a robust system of workers' rights to breathe life into a just transition. And the areas where we've seen it in the COVID uh, fight has been with teachers, healthcare, and grocery store workers. It just happens that those are three areas where workers have been able to do some things to get some protection. protection. Elaine, I, I, I apologize for cut it off there. Those are three very uh, uh, densely organized sectors, areas where workers actually do have a voice. Thank you so much, Elaine. I appreciate that. Uh, we will um, be getting to our questions for our panelists after we hear from Sharon Tree. Sharon is the senior attorney at the Institute for Agriculture and Trade Policy, where she works on the intersections of trade policy and a variety of issues, including the environment, food, and public health. She's a member of the Intergovernmental Policy Advisory Committee to the U.S. Trade Representative, and also served 11 terms in the Maine State Legislature, where she held numerous positions, including Senate Majority Leader, and chair of the Judiciary Committee. Sharon, thanks for being here. Thanks, Matt. And it's great to be on this great group of people. I've already learned a great deal today. Well, I think this follows naturally from what Elaine was saying. I mean, I, I was sort of uh, asked to kind of wrap up with where do we go from here. And you might think that in the middle of this pandemic, as people are hunkered down in their houses, businesses are shuttered, and the death toll in the US is hovering around 100,000. It's probably surpassed that by now. I haven't looked lately. Uh, that negotiating free trade deals would be way down on the list of things to do. You might even think that there would be lessons that we can learn from the COVID-19 pandemic before we negotiate new trade deals. Um, trade agreements that as we have seen today and heard from our speakers have been the cause of significant economic dislocation spiraling medical costs, the shortages of PPE and medical equipment, and they've led to ramped up uh, greenhouse gas emissions and accelerating climate change. These trade deals have also promoted a factory farm model that hurt farmers, has lowered food quality, and has created the ideal conditions actually for the spread of novel flu viruses from animals to humans. Sound familiar? So you would be wrong, though, if you thought that corporations that have benefited from these trade deals and the U.S. government have learned anything from the pandemic. The U.S. Trade Representative has actually initiated negotiations just this month with the United Kingdom uh, to negotiate a full trade agreement. And they're already moving very quickly at speed and intending to negotiate it as quickly as possible. Negotiations with the European Union were started before the pandemic, and nothing about the pandemic has slowed down or changed the trajectory that was already in place in those discussions. The U.S. has just published negotiating objectives for a comprehensive free trade agreement with Kenya, and the government envisions this to be a model for future FTAs that will kind of march across the African continent. And there's also been talk from the White House about trade deals with India and Brazil. The latter were just they, this week, they closed off travel because of the spiraling cases of infection due to COVID. So it seems that instead of learning lessons from the pandemic, corporations and leaders of developed nations around the world, including here in the US, are looking to further liberalize trade as the solution to our problems. More digital trade should be unregulated, privatized water service, no economic development preference for local companies or workers, deregulate slaughtering operations even more if they could possibly be so. So nothing stands in the way of more profits, just injured or actually dead workers. So just listen to the head editorial board of the Minneapolis Star Tribune. ITP is based actually in Minneapolis, I'm in Maine. Um, but so I get a little bit from Minneapolis. The headline is spur the recovery, including Minnesota by advancing trade with EU and UK. The editorial says the global pandemic shouldn't result in a rejection of globalization, particularly regarding trade. In fact, responding to the worldwide economic shock should mean lowering, not raising 
trade barriers. Or this vision from Toronto's Financial Post. Free trade lets us feed ourselves and the world. To sole source food and shut down borders is almost literally to sow the seeds of famine and economic ruin. It goes on, embracing free trade has never been more important for farmers, food businesses, and families alike. Or our own US trade representative talking about the US-Kenya um, negotiating objectives, saying the current health crisis and economic challenges posed by COVID-19 underscore our desire to strengthen our economic relationship with Kenya and lay the foundations for stronger, more resilient economies to address the current and future health crises. Fine words, but actually, what are the negotiating objectives? They look a lot like past trade deals that have resulted in the conditions that we've been talking about for the last hour. So you get the picture. We really can't allow this moment to be just another phase of disaster capitalism, where corporations are already figuring out today how to profit from the pandemic and governments jump in to help with deregulation, more free trade agreements, and economic austerity. Now, there's been a new willingness in Washington to temporarily at least beef up the safety net and pump funds into our public health infrastructure. But the US Senate now wants to step on the brakes. It's really unclear whether there will be a retreat from providing needed recovery funds. This could be the time that we were turning the corner on providing health care to everyone. We now understand, if we didn't before, I think everyone here did, that people don't have what they need for health care. We could be making sure that everyone is covered by unemployment insurance at a fair replacement wage, as, as Elaine has just pointed out. Even hairstylists, gig workers, or like myself, nonprofit workers are excluded in many states around the country. We need to be focusing on economic policies that don't rely on massive exports and massive imports that can only be achieved by massive corporations. To fix our antitrust laws and enforce what hasn't been gutted yet should be a priority. And to, we should be supporting international cooperation for research and development and to produce treatments and vaccines as opposed to international trade rules that incentivize only private profit and undermine the public good as we've heard earlier today. This is the exact time when we must seize the opportunity to convey a very different message from the one that says ramping up more trade and globalization is the best or the only way out of the depths of the pandemic shredded economy. We can do this starting at the grassroots, as we are today, I think, working at the local and state levels and making sure that our voices and the voices of so many who have been disenfranchised by the current system are listened to as we head into an election season and hopefully out of the pandemic and its dire consequences. So thank you and I'm looking forward to our discussion. Thank you very much, uh, Sharon, Sharon Treat. We have quite a few comments and questions from our viewers today. I don't think we'll have time to get to them all, but there are a few that we should probably uh, take a look at. One question was a concern about whether uh, the pandemic will be used as a pretext by any uh, transnational corporations to further automate their manufacturing. Does anybody have a thought on that? Arthur, maybe maybe you'd like to take yeah. that. Yeah, sure, I'm happy to jump in. Um, you know, as, as Elaine said, uh, the pandemic has suddenly made things that were impossible, possible. And so I think it's really important that we start, you know, capturing the narrative of what should be coming out of this pandemic and how we rebuild our economy moving forward to become uh, more resilient. Unfortunately, you know, like, like Bryn said, pharma's not gonna stop pharma Inc. <laughs> and uh, the Chamber of Commerce is not gonna stop, you know, chambering in terms of pushing outsourcing and other problems. Um, you know, automation is one, outsourcing is another very, very big one. Um, and we're already hearing, you know, as, um, as Sherrod mentioned, you know, corporations pushing for new business as usual trade agreements and, and sort of doubling down on the narrative that these free trade agreements are the only way to, to rebuild the global economy that's currently suffering right now. 
Um, and so, uh, yes, we should absolutely expect uh, corporate interest groups to keep doubling down on the same things that they've always pushed for and the same sort of responses they've always had. Uh, and I think it's really incumbent upon us to try to reshape the narrative in terms of what this moment means and what we need moving forward in terms of, I mean, frankly, equality for workers, you know, within the United States and across borders, uh, but also for the environment and access to medicine uh, and support for family farmers and some of the other issues that we've discussed today. Another question uh, from a viewer, do pharma companies use higher prices in the United States to subsidize lower prices elsewhere? If so, would the companies make sufficient profit if the U.S. prices were comparably lower? Um, Dana Gill, would you be interested in taking that one? Yeah, and I'm sure Bryn has a couple of things to say on this as well. There are so many policy options and opportunities here. And as I discussed in uh, my presentation, you know, a huge issue at play here is that pharmaceutical companies have monopoly power and they get to charge as much as they want here in the United States with no strings attached, right? And they'll often use, I, I really liked Bryn's slide about uh, busting the pharma myths, right? We'll often hear that they must charge these high prices in order to recoup the research and development costs that go into, um, into these treatments and vaccines. But let's use COVID as an example. We are seeing an unprecedented amount of public funding for research and development going toward um, test treatments and vaccines. Billions of dollars. Just a, a back of the napkin sketch that, that we did in the office recently was, was a tally of already more than $30 billion in, in U.S. taxpayer funding. Um, so if the United States government is paying for your research and development, where is your argument about needing to to charge high prices stand, right? And so that's just in the time of COVID. But we know that on a, on a regular Tuesday, um, the NIH and, and other public bodies are, are uh, contributing up to 40% of the research and development that, that stands. And I think one of the most important, really easy policy steps we can take now and why it hasn't been done is inexplicable, is calling for transparency about where these dollars are going, right? How can we compare what a pharmaceutical company is saying they need to charge here versus anywhere else if we can't see the numbers? So there is a real need, particularly during this time, where billions um, around the globe, I just gave you the US figure, but we know that other governments, other uh, multilateral entities, other philanthropic entities are stepping in to make sure that what uh, needs to be developed can be developed and as quickly as possible, um, but with no strings attached and with, and with no transparency at this moment, right? So we really need to, to take some of these policy steps forward. Transparency, IP reform, Attaching other, um, attaching other stipulations to the dollars that are, that are coming so we can bust some of these myths about why the prices need to be as high as they are. Clearly, it's not working. It's not working in the U.S. It's not working around the world, and we, we need to do some different things. I'm sure Bryn wants to add to that, so I'll, I'll stop there. Can I jump in real quick? Uh, sure. Yeah, just to reiterate, you know, um, I do think you, you'll see from like, I think the Kaiser Family Foundation has, has shown that, you know, the U.S. is paying um, the highest in terms of um, health care costs and in terms of the, the high drug prices. Um, and um, I just want to kind of reiterate that there's no fair price in monopoly. So we need to kind of bust that monopoly and encourage generic competition and employ any kind of legal flexibilities that are out there. And I think a number of other questions that had come up in the thread, it, um, I mean, this would include things like having that sort of pricing transparency. That should be one of the conditions that you attach in anything that's been publicly uh, funded in the R&D, the R&D, R&D process, R&D process, cost of, of production. Um, and there is something out there called 
called Delinkage. It is one of, uh, it's, it's well written about, um, and it shows like, it's kind of differentiating what is the cost of production versus like sort of the end price and how are we gonna set that price? Um, and as Andrew Hill again mentions that the cost of production for the hep C cure is $62 and it includes a profit margin. And you can, you can negotiate that kind of profit margin. And that's something that we've been discussing a lot with our, our allies. Um, so there's that, there's parallel importation that again, someone had mentioned. And I feel like that's something that um, it should be one of the, the opportunities, it should be one of the, um, the tools that we could employ. But there's other mechanisms in the US like the compulsory license mechanism or government use license mechanism that would actually um, could avoid having to do something like that. We would actually say, you know, we have adequately remunerated the original patent owner and we could um, employ something like compulsory license. Um, and as opposed to saying, okay, we're going to tap into other other countries, um, you know, uh, drug supply. It has to be something where um, we are accommodating uh, and supplying to the, the to the U.S. patients, but we're not using price in a way. We're not allowing for these kind of kinds of companies to to charge such a high price at the at the get go. So I think it's important for uh, for us to also know like these kinds of farm strategies. They're going to put things in there like two tiered pricing mechanisms. They're trying to overcomplicate it, but we just need to be able to say and to push back. We're not going to pay these prices. And unfortunately, until we have something like a price control mechanism in the U.S., or unless we have the ability for a large payer like Medicare Part D to negotiate those prices, we're going to continue to pay this kind of like, um, you know, it, it, it pay whatever the market will bear. We have a lot of great questions. Unfortunately, we're short on time as as concise as you can be for a really big question. How much concern is there about corporations using investor state dispute settlement mechanisms to extract settlements from nations for their efforts to save lives and bend the curve during COVID-19? What, what can we do about that? Anybody want to grab that one? I don't know, Sharon, if you want to jump in. Well, I mean, I just know that they are bringing these cases. And so I think this is, again, it's a teachable moment for people to understand that these, you know, investor state dispute settlement is something that comes out of trade agreement that gives uh, corporations and very large corporations the opportunity to sue governments and challenge um, government policies and try to seek millions and billions of dollars of damages that they say their profits are, are hurt by policies that are there to protect the public good. And this is something that, you know, has been scaled back some in the USMCA or new NAFTA, but it should be absolutely not part of any new trade agreement going forward. And we need to make the case. And I think that one of the opportunities, Elaine talked about opportunities with the COVID pandemic, and we have opportunities to explain to people about what some of these things are and understand have much better understanding about how what it really means to their lives and to the lives of everybody else around the world when these tools are available and they're being locked into um, these treaties and trade agreements around the world uh, and you know that unless we rethink how we do our trade policy in the future and you know we're going to be doomed to continue to have these very bad policies in the future and you know that's going to happen unless we really make the case right now very strongly and clearly when people's attention is focused uh, on, on what's happening right now thank you sharon uh, and thanks again to our panelists dana gill Bryn gay arthur stimulus elaine bernard and sharon treat before we reach the end of our time together, let me transition here and raise some important action items. Despite all the things our presenters have talked about in terms of how trade policy has made our communities less resilient in the face of COVID-19, right now, today, corporate lobby groups are actually pushing for more free trade deals in Africa and Europe and in South America that would put our communities at even further risk. These companies want new intellectual property rights for pharmaceutical companies, new protections for trade secrets, and an even greater race to the bottom in wages and environmental standards as they push new trade deals everywhere from East Africa to Brazil. We need your help breaking into the media narrative about COVID-19 to explain to our communities why profit first trade deals are no longer acceptable. The good news 
is that the current pandemic has more people thinking about how global supply chains and the global economy affect them more than ever before. So we need to grab hold of that opportunity with both hands. Over the coming days, we'll be emailing you with links to some online action tools that will help you submit a letter to the editor to your local newspaper describing how bad trade policies have made our region less resilient in the face of COVID-19 and how trade policy should be done differently moving forward. If each of us takes a few minutes to personalize and submit a letter to the editor, we should get dozens published from Bangor to Albany to Scranton. Letters to the editor are a great way of spreading the ideas discussed today because the letter section is both one of the most read sections of any newspaper and also because each and every congressional office across the country makes sure to monitor letters to the editor to gauge how their constituents are thinking. So when you get that letter to the editor submission tool, please take a moment to use it and submit a letter on whatever you learned today that resonated the most with you. Then, in a couple of weeks from now, I hope to send you a follow-up email with links to a number of the letters that, and op-eds that you and your presenters, our presenters today, get published so that you can help share them on Facebook or, or Twitter and on Instagram. This is a moment when people are open to learning more about this topic and we wanna make sure that as many of your friends and colleagues as possible gain access to this information. Again, thank you for joining us. My name is Matthew Beck, I'm with Maine Fair Trade Campaign, and this has been the Northeast Virtual Town Hall on COVID-19 Trade and Resilience. Goodbye. Thank you. Thanks, Matt. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Be well. Thank you. Be safe.